All right, good evening, everyone. I am literally an open book, as you can see here. Now, you're supposed to laugh when I tell a joke, okay? <laughs> yeah, that is a command. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, all right, so this is going to be a 15-minute talk. I'm gonna give you a little bit of information on how I survived to be 35 years old. Um, I uh, grew up with two older brothers who were 6'8". My dad was 6'4", so I was the runt of the family. So survival was part of my growing up. Um, Two-on-two basketball was some serious business in my family. Um, it was su Sunday's usually family day, and two-on-two uh, -two is my dad and I versus my brothers, and we usually got slammed. Um, had to eat my food very fast in order to get enough food. Um, learned how to climb ropes, do pull-ups, um, escape booby traps, all that kind of stuff growing up. Uh, needless to say, I grew a very strong will growing up. Um, had to stick up for myself a lot. Uh, being the only girl in a, in a uh, very testosterone-ridden family, um, I wanted to be equal. I didn't want my dad treating me differently. I wanted to mow the lawn and chop wood um, because I knew I would get crap from my brothers if I didn't. <clears throat> he gave in, of course. Um, even when I moved 3,000 miles away to go to college, uh, dating, you know, I wasn't allowed to date growing up, but finally when I went to college, uh, dating was an option because there was no father around, but my dates were still somehow harassed. Uh, word traveled fast, and I didn't date that many people for very long. Um, but thankfully, I did date someone amazing and got married to him. Perry Larson is here. Um, and he's been a rock for me for three years and counting. Married, anyway. Uh, but, okay, so to get to the bread and butter of tonight's talk. Uh, tonight is about surviving as a leader for the long haul. And this is some language some of you probably will relate to betting in the military. It is easy to win a battle, and it is harder to occupy the territory for the long haul. In other words, focusing for a short period of, of time intensely is easy. It's easy like in business. It's easy to have a plan. It's easy to get excited. But what about the time it takes to put in the time to make that business happen? It doesn't happen overnight. <clears throat> Neither does building a good team. Neither does keeping yourself healthy. It takes conscious choices every day to keep yourself healthy. Having a family, keeping yourself healthy with your family. Set an example for your children. It takes a conscious daily effort. So the truth is, for me, to survive over the long haul as an effective leader, I've been through my ups and downs. Um, my time as a captain of my softball team, time as my platoon commander of my Marine Corps platoon, um, I needed to learn how to care for myself. And that is not selfish. Taking care of yourself first, putting yourself first, means you'll be that much more of an effective leader. Now, I learned the hard way, though, with this. It didn't happen, I didn't realize that until I hit rock bottom. And that's why I have a memoir. <laughs> because I'm sharing that story, because I know I'm not alone. Raise your hand here if you have baggage. Yeah, okay, good, good, so do I. So I'm up here. Um, now, who's ever, you know, did their grandparents or had a friend come over and all they talk about is the amount of pills they take, how much pain they're in, the guy that dumped them last month, or girl, or it's always something negative, right? So we all have something. Maybe it's a, an addiction we've had. Maybe it's a bad breakup. Maybe there's something that's, there's this demon that we hold inside and we just want to talk to people about it. Well, that's okay. But there's another way of looking at your baggage. Okay, you can look at it as something that pulls you down or you can look at it as something that can build you up. Like the pain that you've been through, maybe the back injury that you had or the breakup you had. Why can't we look at that baggage as something to learn from? So the secret, kind of my secret weapon, is the fact that my baggage is my secret weapon. <clears throat> I don't let it get me down, and it gives me daily motivation to take care of myself so I can better lead a team, 
and be up here talking to you guys and empowering others. It is a daily effort. So now I'm going to tell you a very uncomfortable and embarrassing story. Who wants to hear it? OK. Everybody likes uncomfortable and embarrassing stories. So you know, I was buried alive growing up. My brothers did that. Um, I peed a range. Uh, did that a few times, actually. Uh, negative 16 degree weather, that might happen to you if you have a full bladder and you're laying down. Um, I did swear on television and on the radio. Um, even in Iraq, when I was on convoys, I swore over the radio, and that's not really allowed. Uh, so I have quite the mouth. So if I drop a slip an F-bomb or something, for those of uh, virgin ears, apologies. Um, <clears throat> I've had many embarrassing moments, let's just say that. And I'm happy to be able to laugh at myself now. On a more serious note, uh, I grew up thriving on winning, thriving on being perfect, looking perfect. I grew up defining myself by the accomplishments of being the best in my sport, being the fastest, being the most athletic, having the most newspaper articles written about her, uh, eventually being the best Marine. I couldn't fail, and if I did, I would, well, I dieted conscious, I dieted all the time. I worked out conscious, cons consistently too much every day. And I was fearful of letting myself go. I was fearful of being weak. I was fearful of not being perfect. Who can relate to that? Who's ever wanted something bad enough where they were fear of losing, fear of being seen as weak, um, fear of failing? So I was more fearful of being weak or being seen as weak to my Marines or failing than I was of actually taking care of myself. I threw up four or five times a day. So I had bulimia. But I did not want to admit that I had a problem because it was an eating problem, right? Who cares? I didn't show up to work drunk. I didn't show up to work high. I show up to work with a full belly, and then I'd throw it up. That was my, that's my embarrassing story. It is embarrassing, it's not easy to talk about, and it wasn't a vanity thing, why I had it. Yeah, I wanted to look good, I wanted to compete, but I was more fearful, that's the way I coped with life, with stress, is I would go diet, or I would eat or not eat, and I would throw it up, or I'd work out. It's my way of coping, because I didn't want to fail. It's, and so that eating disorder um, is called an addiction. It's, it's similar to any other addiction. I'm not proud of that, but I'm proud of the way I handled it. <clears throat> so you see, I, was, I wanted to be seen as strong and competent to my Marines, and I was. I got the job done. I look the way I do now. No one could tell I had a problem. But on the inside, I was in my own personal prison. For those of you that know someone with an addiction, or have had one, or struggled with mental illness, probably can relate to that or see it. It's a personal prison. <clears throat> so here I am in Iraq, um, leading a Marine, 54 mar so have a platoon of 54 Marines. Um, I actually really loved my job. I love the Marines I worked with, minus a couple, of course. Uh, <laughs> in the ass. But so my job was doing landmine clearing um, because I was the tallest, biggest, badass female lieutenant on Fallujah, Camp Fallujah. I was asked to escort female terrorists, insurgents, back to their villages. So it was my night job. And then during the day, I would run convoys um, before women were even allowed, you know, recognized as being in combat. And so I, wasn't, I didn't have a desk job, so to speak. And, but here I am still throwing up four or five times a day. How do I do it? Oh, you figure it out. Because that's your way of coping. You figure it out. And so my private time was in the bathroom um, when I did have private time. Uh, and I was struggling. But I could not let anyone see that. But uh, during this time, I'd 
the only person I'd really shared my story with was my dad. I, I was very close with him, and I could not help but call him and kind of share what I was struggling with. And this was one of the letters he wrote me. My dad, mind you, is a Catholic priest. So he's a Catholic priest, um, widower, took in vocation. So he says, Dad is sitting here at his desk with an overwhelming pride for you as well as a deep concern, almost worry. I'm proud that you are who you are, God's child, my child, who is doing her very best every day of her life. While you affect so many people with your stature and attitude, your life is a merry-go-round. If you want to stay mentally healthy, then get off and seek help now. The key ingredient is your, the key ingredient is your willingness to get help. If, it is, put it, if you put it off, it will be a silent cancer that will kill you. So how's that for a letter from your dad? Um, but it's true, it gave me perspective. After that, 2005 elections happened, returned after a 12 hour convoy, asked for help from my commander. I'm throwing up, sir, I don't love myself. How do you think that went down? Not so well. Hours later, I found myself voluntarily, I voluntarily asked to be medevaced because I knew something was wrong and I knew that I was going to hurt somebody had I stayed, because I didn't have a desk job. So I asked to go home. So I'm sitting on the tarmac in a C-130 with people who have physical wounds, people who are killed, and here I am with an invisible wound. I felt worthless. But this worthlessness did get better. At the point I did ask for help and came home, which I did not want to do, because I always stuck to the end for everything. Um, I started to, because I finally started to put myself first. I was damn good at taking care of other people, but not good at taking care of myself. So Warrior, my book was born from this. Kind of the lack of understanding, even in myself, what an eating disorder was, what an addiction was, how to get over, overcome perfectionism. And I knew that society didn't understand it either. Because as on paper, before I deployed deployment, I could do no wrong. Once I got home, rumors were spread about me being knocked up, didn't have a boyfriend, didn't touch anybody. It just, it's what happens. When people don't know, they judge. And so I let that crush me for a short period of time, and then I didn't anymore. I made the choice to change it to continue to get better and to keep fight because people don't understand it. And so what I'm gonna do is dedicate my life, I decided to dedicate my life to being healthy, the most healthy I could be, and to educate people that everyone has human struggles, everyone has a struggle, maybe even an invisible wound, and you can heal, and you have to block out the naysayers. <clears throat> so in conclusion, to survive as a leader, you must take care of yourself. I won the battle with bulimia. I was an effective leader. I admitted I wasn't 100%. If you knew your leader was sick, would you want them to admit they had a problem and get help? There was plenty of people that could have done my job as a platoon commander. Maybe not as well, maybe some better, but there's always someone. I'm happy that I was able to step off that highway of self-destruction. So I won that battle, and I'm continuing to win it every day by a daily choice. Now as a doctor of physical therapy, a strength coach, a speaker for CrossFit, I run two businesses, I have to take care of myself. Running a team, I have to. What I'm thankful for is the fact that I'm making a decision to meditate daily, pray. Sometimes it's a little bit of both. Move. Tell myself positive thoughts. Hang out with people. I have the power to do that. So leadership for me, for, so for leadership for everyone is, should start with yourself. Never give up. And you really do have to want it. Because it's not gonna happen. Um, someone can't tell you to get help. Someone can't tell you to be better. You have to want it.